the web the web that we know right now has gone through three main transitions throughout our life right there's been web one web two and web three right web one is the information economy it's the first time that we're able to kind of read right on the internet and so what this created was people were able to you know surf the internet read on web pages and access more information than ever before you know and companies like google you know came out of web one the winners because they created the best search engine and now you know where in terms of you had to before go and buy an encyclopedia and read you know a two pages about dolphins now i can go and research anything about dolphins and find out every single little tiny piece of that and like web one was the start of the internet and it really like kind of was the catalyst for everything else that you know we've seen today then 2004 came along and facebook hit and facebook started web 2 and web 2 is the platform economy right and so what that means is people are now able to read and write onto the internet simultaneously so now people can do social interactions on the internet and people can do economic interactions with each other on the internet. Web2 created social media. Now we have Instagram, now we have, you know, Twitter. We can write, we can tweet a post and it's like a text message to the entire world. And like literally that could go viral and so many and millions of people can go see that now. Nobody was able to do that before. You know what I mean? So writing onto the internet, reading onto the, like you now you can read and write on the internet. So web two created, um, the first thing it created obviously is social media, but the second thing it created was e-commerce. Now people can transact on the internet as well. And so we see, you know, Amazon and their business model around e-commerce. And you're like, okay, like that's kind of where we're, where we're moving to So I think, you know, web two is the internet that we've been in like this whole time that like we really like grown up in and been focused on. Like we grew up with Snapchat and with, you know, Instagram and we've seen like the whole rise of all of that. And like, I feel like over the time, like we, they, they are the winners of web two. Um, but there is a problem with web two. The problem with web two is the platforms have us in a chokehold. They essentially we are essentially the product of web2 so especially for the advertising business model we're literally the product you know what i mean we're the product and the consumer is the advertising companies so it's like you know what is what is facebook doing facebook is selling our data to advertisers in order to get them targeted ads back to us so what does that make us it makes us the product you know what i mean and so the problem with that is you know Facebook and all of these other companies have a data monopoly over us. You know what I mean? They can, they know more about us than we know about ourselves. And they have all that information. They can surf through all that information. We're kind of at will to anything that they could do. And the other part of that is there is a person in charge and a company in charge. And we don't really have any say on how, you know, everything can get better. They just are completely controlling everything that you know they do and we do so that's web 2 and so what is web 3 3.0 is a back-end revolution it's not a front-end revolution so people won't necessarily be able to see the impact of web 2.0 from a user's aspect of things but it is more so kind of a back-end revolution because we're replacing you know these companies with servers with kind of peer-to-peer -peer networks and essentially what that means is this, if we wanted to, if you like right now, if you wanted to send me money, you would cash at me 20 bucks, right? Cash app would tell your bank, yo, you want to send max 20 bucks. Your bank would go look at their ledger and see that you have $500 in your account. And they would say, okay, Shane's able to send me 20 bucks. So your bank will send my bank 20 bucks. And right, you know, Shane went from $500 to $480. You know what I mean? And so the banks 
we trust the banks because the banks are able to facilitate our payments. And so, you know, we kind of allow them to do that because it makes everything a lot more secure. And so the biggest change happened when the Bitcoin white paper came out in 2008. And it essentially, Bitcoin is peer to peer electronic cash that can be transacted without the use of a third party. So essentially, the biggest thing about Bitcoin and the blockchain is that now instead of a bank having to verify our transactions, every single person in the on the internet, every single node can verify the transactions and they can do it in a trustworthy way because they're incentivized to do it good. What the blockchain is, so the banks have, you know, right now the banks have the ledgers, right? So the blockchain is a public ledger that everybody can go in and see and access, meaning that every single person can see every single dollar that has been transacted on the blockchain. Um, and the reason why it is like that is it is a public thing. So it's more so... Okay, imagine having like a uh, a security deposit box. Imagine having a security deposit box, but the security deposit box is clear. So people can see straight into your bank account, right? But yet you own, you're the only person that has a key to access that security deposit box. And on top of that, um, the goal is for you to not tell everybody that that's your security deposit box. So nobody would know it's you anyway. So that's fine, right? And so essentially what blockchain does is it creates this consensus mechanism that allows people to verify transactions in a trustworthy way. Okay, so I'll talk about like Bitcoin and, and how that works. So essentially how it works is if I wanted to send you five Bitcoin, right? I would try to send you five Bitcoin and there's something called proof of work. And essentially what that means is with Bitcoin, a bunch of different nodes, which are people um, that are essentially like mining cryptocurrency, right? So a bunch of different nodes are racing to verify this transaction. Okay, Max has 10 Bitcoin, right? I can take five Bitcoin from him and trans and, and send it to you because it's proven that I have those 10 Bitcoin. And so you would say, okay, well, why is somebody, why would somebody be trusted to execute transactions the way banks do? Well, it comes to that consensus mechanism. So it's like essentially mining for gold. That's why they call it mining. So imagine, you know, people are mining for gold and when they're mining for gold, you know, they get to keep a little portion of the new gold that they mined. It. So yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's a fixed supply of gold out there, right? And yeah, some of the gold is coming back and it's being transacted between all of us. But that person that mined that gold, they can keep a little piece for themselves. And that's what makes it so that, you know, they're being trustworthy and they're actually, you know, representing good faith. Exactly. And so now we can send you know peer-to-peer -peer cat like i can send you money without my bank or your bank being in anything now i now it's literally just me to you and there's someone that's in the middle that says okay max has this amount of bread he can actually afford to do that and they facilitate that transaction for me so that's what bitcoin is right the next biggest development was ethereum and obviously I told you about Ethereum, but essentially what Ethereum is, is Ethereum is the world's programmable blockchain. It allows the execution of smart contracts. So Ethereum is a blockchain that allows the execution of smart contracts. A smart contract is a system that automatically moves digital assets determined by predefined rules. Meaning I can write a smart contract that says if Shane has five Bitcoin in his account, his profile turns green. If Shane has 10 Bitcoin in his account, his profile turns purple. And so like that type of 
aspect of things, the smart contracts are literally able to execute transactions automatically because it's just a line of code that executes transactions automatically. That's all that a smart contract is. It's literally, so I can say, um, I can write, say, okay, I can take a house, right? I can take my house right now and I can mint it onto Ethereum, right? And I can write a smart contract that says every time somebody transacts the house after I sell it the first time, I get a 1% royalty on the transaction. And so what the smart contract will do is the smart contract will execute that transaction every single time to no fault. And so that's what gave us the ability to have tokens, right? And so there's two types of tokens. There's non-fungible tokens and there's fungible tokens. Non-fungible tokens are NFTs. An NFT is simply a token that represents a unique digital asset. And so the different parts of an NFT is, it starts with the first two letters, NF. It means non-fungible. So essentially what that means is that um, your house can't be like traded with another like house. Like there's not like your house is worth market value. You can't like specifically trade that for another house or like your artwork. You can't like trade that specifically for another piece of artwork or like a specific thing because it's kind of worth whatever people will pay for it. And so that's what like a non fungible token means. And so a fungible token is the opposite. It means that it can be exchanged. So Fungible tokens are Bitcoin, Solana, Ethereum, US dollars. US dollars are fungible tokens. I can give you $5 and you can give me back $5 and $5 is $5. You know what I mean? And that's that's what that means. So like the non-fungible tokens can be unique digital assets, but the fungible tokens are literally just, you know, five, you know, five tokens is five tokens no matter what. You know, I can give you five tokens and you can give me back five tokens and that's that can be easily exchanged. We can now create. So, OK, so let's talk about Ethereum again. Right. So I told you Ethereum allows us to write smart contracts. And what this creates is it allows us to make decentralized apps and decentralized organizations because the smart contracts can execute all of the monotonous stuff that people were having to execute before. So for example, right, I wanna create an app, right? So I'm gonna create the Fits app and the Fits app is gonna be a decentralized application on top of a smart contract blockchain like Ethereum or Solana, right? And so the reason why I would do that is because now I'm using the NFTs and I'm using fungible tokens in order to power our system. 